quiet, we quiet our hearts before you, Lord, and we come humbly into your presence. And Lord, we thank you that you're here. Lord, we realize this is your church. We're your men, and we, we want to just respect you and honor you with the things we say and do tonight. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would come now, that you would flood our hearts, that you would minister to us, that you would speak to us. And God, that you would make us strong for these days that we're living in. And we know, Lord, that it's your word that makes us strong. So we go to your word, and we thank you that we have this opportunity. We thank you that we can gather like this. Thank you for the freedoms we have. And Lord, I definitely thank you for all my brothers, and I pray that you would minister to them and speak to them and make each one of them individually strong so that we can be strong as we are united together in Christ. So, Lord, bless our time now as we look at Revelation chapter 4. And, Lord, we just thank you that we can study it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We've come to a very important transition here in Revelation. Um, What we're going to see tonight is so vitally important for all of us to understand because it's possible that some of you guys have had a very rough year. Sometimes things get tough. You look at what's going on in the world and you wonder where is God? And you're praying, you're seeking, you're reading, you're walking with the Lord and he just seems to be absent sometimes or silent sometimes. And we wonder why all this junk's going on in our world, in our country, and we look at all the evil that's being promoted from our government and from uh, school boards and every, it's coming from every direction, really. But there's one thing we need to understand, and that is God is on the throne. God is on the throne. So no matter what you have gone on in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it's been, listen, God is in control, God is on the throne, and God is the one that will take care of all of your stuff if you cry out to him and come to him and put your trust in him. So as we move into this next year with the election coming up and everything, I think it's going to be vital for us as men in the church in America today to know and and solidify that in our hearts, that God is on the throne. There's not one thing going on in the world that God's not aware of, that he can't handle, that he can't overcome, that he can't work out. He's the all-powerful, almighty God who sits on the throne above everything else. And that's the one we're going to see here in Revelation 4. In Revelation 4, we see the throne. We see the one sitting on the throne. We see what's coming from the throne. We see what's around the throne, in the midst of the throne, and before the throne. This chapter is all about the throne. And we have this opportunity to go right into the throne room with our brother and apostle John. Now the church age is over. That's where we are here in Revelation, and this transition's taking place. When we started the book of Revelation, I told you guys that this is a singular revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole book is one singular revelation. It's the unveiling of Jesus. Inside the revelation, inside the book, there are various visions. We've already seen one vision, and that one vision fit into two pieces of the divine outline that we have in Revelation 1.19, where John was instructed to write the things that he had seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So the whole book of Revelation is broken down into these three things that God gives us as a divine outline. Now, back in chapter 1, we saw the first vision. And the first vision was inside of the things that had been seen. 
Write the things, John, that you have seen. What did John see in Revelation chapter 1? He saw a literal vision of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ in his glory and gave us a description of what he looks like in his glorified state. John literally saw Jesus Christ in his glorified state and gave us a description of him the way he is now. And then we move into the things which are the present time that we live in. So if you're breaking this down, this is vital for you to understand, and this really brings a lot of simplicity to the book of Revelation. So when we looked at Revelation 2 and 3, it's all part of the same vision from chapter 1. It's one vision in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 but it has a separate outline. The things that you have seen and the things which are. The things that are are the present time that we live in. It's the entire church age. From the day of Pentecost to the day of the rapture, that is the church age. Jesus writes these literal letters to the first century churches that were in Asia Minor, and John was instructed by Jesus to write these letters down and send it to the seven churches. So we looked at these specific letters to these seven churches, seven literal churches. There was a lot more than seven churches, but the number seven represents completeness. So this letter or these letters go out to the complete church, not only in the first century, but to all of church history. Today, living 2,000 years later, we still have these letters because they're preserved by the angels and sent to the pastors, and we can stand here or sit here tonight, and we can look at what Jesus said to the churches 2,000 years ago and still have application for us as men living in these last days. It's amazing. So now we're making a transition, and whenever the book of Revelation makes this transition, where the scene changes, the vision changes. It's important that you pick up on that so that you can understand what's going on. So as we look at chapter 4, the transition is now being made where John was speaking to the church on earth. But now in chapter 4 and chapter 5, the church is no longer on earth because the rapture takes place here in chapter 4. Even though I wouldn't make chapter 4 a major part of my proof for a pre-tribulation rapture, you can see that the typology is there, like Mike said. And so when we look at this, this is really the only place in the book of Revelation that the rapture of the church fits because nothing else really makes sense. Now, if you're here tonight and you don't believe in a pre-trib rapture, that's fine. But I hope you can defend what you do believe in. Because we've already looked at enough scripture already to prove that the church will not be here from Revelation 6 to Revelation 18. The church is gone. The church is not mentioned again after Revelation 3, except for this fact that we see the church present in heaven. So, it's very important to see this transition where John is speaking to the church on earth, and now he's being transported into the throne room where he sees God the Father sitting on his throne. Now, as we get into this chapter, I want you guys to know that there's a lot of different ideas about what some of this stuff means. And to be honest with you, all I want to do is focus on the stuff that's clear. Because there's some things in this chapter that may not be clear because we're still finite beings, and we're trying to understand an infinite God that lives outside of time and space in this other dimension where 
trying to get our minds wrapped around everything in heaven and everything about this one who sits on the throne is basically impossible in the here and now. But God wants us to know. And the things he wants us to know is clearly spelled out. And so we're going to look at the things here in chapter 4 and chapter 5, and we're going to get some type of idea of what it will be like the moment we leave this earth. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready. No earth lovers here? No tree huggers? Good. I love you guys. So let's go to the text. Verse 1, Revelation 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance as an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads." And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne, there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had the face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. And in the Greek, it's nine times. Holy, 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 holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive the glory honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now, that's 11 verses, but that's a lot. So as we make this transition, it's important to understand that there are outside scriptures out of this text that supports everything that's happening here to make the rapture fit in to this passage. And one thing I want you to understand is when the church goes up, this is taking place in heaven. But soon as the church goes up, there's not like a gap of time before the Antichrist arrives. Soon as the church goes up, at the end of chapter 3, what's taking place on earth is chapter 6 immediately starts. So it goes right from chapter 3, and the church now is complete. The last Gentile believer comes to saving faith. And then the church goes up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And when that happens, Jesus is breaking the first seal to release the judgment that's coming down on the earth in Revelation 6. So you got to hang with that. You got to see that. Because on earth, there's really no break between the removal of the church and the judgment that's going to take place on the earth. 
So if you separate this scene that's in heaven from the text, you could actually go right in to chapter 6 when you're done reading chapter 3, and you'll know what the continual events are that are taking place on the earth. But we have this scene. We have this catching away. We have this glimpse into the throne room before Jesus breaks the seal so that we can understand what will be taking place on the earth. Now, I love this because when I look at this throne room, I visualize like the Pentagon, the heavenly Pentagon, not the United States Pentagon, but this is the war room of heaven. What a phenomenal thing that's going to be on the day we're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and to stand before the throne of God in the war room. There's getting ready to be a war. Did you guys know that? There's getting ready to be wrath and judgment and pain and suffering such as the world has never seen before. Jesus said it would be a time of trouble on earth that the world has never seen before. It will affect the entire earth. It will center in the nation of Israel and it will go out from there and the effects of the wrath and the judgment that's coming will affect every single person that lives on the planet that has been left behind after the rapture of the church. Did you guys know some people are going to be left behind because they didn't put their faith in Jesus? We know there's going to be churches that go through the tribulation. We already saw it. We know the church in Thyatira is going to be left behind. They're never going to see the war room. They're never going to see the throne of God because they continued in their sin. Oh, they were a church organization, but they weren't genuinely saved. They were a church full of unbelievers that were practicing idolatry and sexual immorality. And Jesus gave them time to repent, and they did not repent. And Jesus said, because you didn't repent, even though I was graciously giving you time, I'm going to cast you into the tribulation and into a sickbed, and I'm going to kill your offspring with death. That's the words of Jesus in Revelation 2. To Thyatira. So will there be a church in the tribulation on the earth after the rapture? Yes. But it won't be a real church. It'll be the liberal churches that don't care about God's word, don't care about holiness, don't care about purity. They don't live for God because they don't know God and they're never going to see the throne of God because they've rejected God. But there is a church that will be caught up in the clouds, and we looked at that church, and that church is Philadelphia. And what did Jesus say to the church in Philadelphia? Because you've kept my word, you haven't denied my name, and you've persevered, because you've been faithfully true to me, I've put before you open doors so that you can walk into all the opportunities that I have for you. And at the end of all this, because you've been faithful to me, I will keep you from the great hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I like that promise. I want to be in that church. And since I want to be in that church, that's why I love this book. That's why I stay in the word. That's why I keep the worship music on. That's why I walk the walk. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, right? But you are in a relationship with God through faith. And because you're in a relationship with God through faith, you can be sure that when this event called the rapture, even though the word rapture is not in our English Bible, when the rapture happens, The word in our Bible is caught up, the catching away, the harpasu. When it does happen, we're going up and we're going to be in the throne room of God. Do you believe that? Now, if you're here tonight, you're playing games and you're goofing around and you're not serious about your faith and you're really not walking with the Lord. And I doubt there's anybody here like that, but you never know. I believe most of you guys are genuine brothers in the faith if not all. And if you are, 
Everything that's happening in your life can instantly change. And this mortal, this mortal body, this, this mortal that you live in, this in, immortal body, you'll, you'll become an immortal. This mortal body will become immortal in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be changed, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Because this flesh and this blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What I have right here cannot enter into the throne room of God and into the presence of God because this body wasn't made for heaven, it was made for earth. But when the rapture happens, the dead will come out of the graves, the dead in Christ, and they will rise, and they will be given new bodies. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you can comfort one another with those words. You can take comfort in knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and when Jesus calls his church home, you will go up, and this mortal will put on immortality, his corruption will put on incorruption, and you will instantly be standing before God Almighty. And you will see him for the first time on his throne. And we're going to talk about what that will be like to see him on his throne. How many of you guys are looking forward to the moment that that happens? And if you're not, you're just not old enough yet. If you get a little older, you'll be looking more forward than you were a few years back. Look at all you young guys like, nah, I'm good, dude. <laughs> the older guys are like, ah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go, man. Come get me, Jesus. Don't worry, he's coming. And so now this transition has taken place. And it takes place when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. How do I know that? Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. This is a vital passage for all of us to understand. In Romans chapter 11, it's talking about Israel and how God's not done with Israel. He hasn't cast them off. He's got a plan. They're still in his promise. He's going to keep his promise to the nation of Israel. And God says, I don't want you church age believers to be ignorant about what I'm doing with the Jewish people, with Israel. Look what he says in verse 25 of Romans 11. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery regarding Israel, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel for how long? Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, notice what it says, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Don't let anybody tell you that God is done with Israel or Israel is the church today. When the fullness of the Gentiles come in, when, when God finally saves the last person in the church age, when they come to faith, Whoever that is, the fullness of the Gentiles will be in and the church will be caught up to God. And then the seven years that was determined for Israel, the holy people, the holy city will be accomplished. The promise of God to Israel in Daniel 9, verse 24, when he takes away their sins and puts his spirit back on them in Zechariah 12, it's going to happen once the church is gone. In fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the Antichrist, the one who's going to persecute Israel and slaughter millions of Jews during the tribulation period and millions of people who come to faith as Gentiles during the tribulation, he can't even come onto the world scene until the church is gone, because the church is here restraining the lawless one from coming onto the scene. 
And Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if anyone tells you that you're in the tribulation, don't let anyone deceive you by any means because that day, the day of the Lord, the beginning of the seven years, it cannot happen until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, until the church is no longer on earth, until the departure takes place first and the church is removed, then the Antichrist, then the lawless one will be revealed. Then he will arrive into the city of Jerusalem in the middle of the tribulation and he will go into the temple and he will tell the world that he's God. I'm God. And he will demand that the whole world worship him and take his mark. But none of that can even happen until the church is removed from the earth. Now understand this. There are still Jews that are in the church. The church was started by Jews. I know you guys understand that. But the church today is mostly made up of Gentiles. And the whole purpose of this age of grace, the church age, is to redeem a Gentile bride for the Lamb. But that's not to the exclusion of God's promise failing for Israel. God's promise will be kept to his people, the Jews, and God will send the deliverer, Jesus, out of Zion, and he will come back to the earth, and he will redeem his people, Israel, and take away their sins. Now, there's another term in Luke chapter 21 that talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. And people get confused about, uh, I'm sorry, the times of the Gentiles. And Look, I'm getting confused about it right now. But people get confused about these two things, the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles is different from the fullness of the Gentiles that we're reading about here in Romans 11. When Jesus said, the time will come when the Gentiles will continue to trample down the holy city under their feet, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles will run all the way out to the end of the tribulation. We've had all these Gentile empires, and all these empires have persecuted Israel. You've had them all. Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Medo-Persian, Grecian Empire, Roman Empire, and then the final Roman Empire, which will be led by the Antichrist, until the end, all the way to the end, desolations are determined for my people and for the holy city. That's what Daniel said. They are going to continue to be crushed by Gentile empires until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. But this is the fullness of the Gentiles. This is different. This is when Jesus comes back and snatches his church out, and we finally go up to be with the Lord. Are you guys tracking with me on that? So you should write these verses down so that you can understand the proper theology regarding the church and Israel. The day is coming when God will come back, and he will keep his covenant with Israel, and he will keep his promise, and he will send the deliverer out of Zion to take away their sins. The blinders will be removed from their eyes and they will realize during that seven years, because that seven years is a part of Old Testament time that's been put on hold during the church age. See Daniel 9. So we still have that seven years coming and it can't come until the church is gone. Once the church clock stops ticking, and the church is raptured, church age is over, then God will start the clock on Israel again, and there's seven years of time left for God to do a mop-up operation on his people, the Jews. And he will do a very good job of it during the tribulation, even though they will be facing destruction such as they've never seen before, and wrath from the devil, and the wrath of the Antichrist, and the mark of the beast, they're going to be in that mix. And we'll talk more about that when we get to Revelation 7. So after these things, John says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things much must take place again after this. 
So he's telling John to come up here. John looks up, he hears the voice like he did in Revelation 1 when he was on the island of Patmos. He heard a voice speaking to him and he turned to see the voice that spoke to him and he saw one like the Son of Man with a garment down to his feet and girded about his chest. He saw Jesus in all his majesty. And now he hears the same voice saying, John, come up here. I'm, I'm moving you from the earth where you're speaking to the church into the throne room of God. And John is now being transported in the spirit because remember, he was taken from the island of Patmos into the tribulation, into the spirit. And God still has more things for him to say to the church. Now, just because the, two, the seven letters are done, it doesn't mean that God's no longer speaking to the church because the whole book of Revelation is written and addressed to the church. But the church age is over and God wants us to know that it's over and now we are moving into the tribulation and God wants us to, even though we're not going to be there, God wants us to understand what's going to happen on the earth after we're gone. So come up here, John, and let me show you the things that will take place after this, after the church age, after what we just looked at in Revelation 2 and 3. And John looks and he sees a door standing open. The door is the access point to the throne room. Somewhere up there, out there, there is a door. We know the Gospels say Jesus is the door. He is our access, but there could be a literal door that God's going to open. The church in Laodicea had closed the door to the church and wouldn't let Jesus in because they were lukewarm and they made Jesus sick. But John doesn't make Jesus sick because he's a type of the genuine believer from Philadelphia and God's saying to John, hey, look, they locked me out of the church, but you're not locked out of heaven. And he's opening the door to the kingdom. Jesus said, I have the keys of David. I have all the authority to open to my people the treasures of the eternal kingdom. It gives me the goosebumps, man. The holy goosebumps, actually. What a day that's going to be when we realize that we're entering through the door into the presence of our God. And we're going to see him there before the throne. Now, there's a lot of other places in Revelation and even some other places in the Bible that talk about God's throne. John's not the first and only guy to see God's throne. The prophet Isaiah saw God's throne. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the whole temple. Isaiah saw the Lord. Daniel saw the Lord. Turn with me to Daniel 7 real quick. Look at Daniel 7 verse 9. Daniel saw the throne of God. I watched till thrones were put in place. It's verse 9. And the ancient of days, that's God the Father, was seated. Just like we read in Revelation. He was seated on his throne. His garments was his garment was white, as white as white as snow, and his, the head of his hair was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels burning fire. A fiery uh, a fire stream, stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousands and thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. And then we'll see in chapter 5, I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. This is verse 13. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom 
that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. So Daniel was there. Daniel saw it. Daniel was in the courtroom of God. He was in the throne room of God. Isaiah was in the throne of room of God. All these guys witnessed it like John is witnessing it here in Revelation chapter 4. So this isn't some new thing. Did you know the apostle Paul went up into the third heaven? And when Paul went up into the third heaven, he was sent back. That would be a miserable thing, wouldn't it be? And when he came back, he said it would be against the law. It would be breaking every rule. I couldn't even, I can't even describe to you the beautiful things that I saw and the things that are being prepared for those who love God. I can't even put it in human, there's no human language for me to describe to you what I saw when I was caught up into the third heaven. So when these people come to us and they say, hey, God took me up into heaven, showed me everything up in heaven, and they come back and they give this big spiel about what they saw in heaven, nonsense. Nonsense. I don't believe any of that stuff. It's all, it's all fake. So after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here. Now, here we see the trumpet again associated with the voice that John is hearing. And then when you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There's a trumpet involved. There's the voice of the archangel. There's the cry of God to his church saying, come up here. And that's when he's taking us off of this earth into his presence. And so you see the similarities there, and he hears a voice, and he hears the trumpet speaking, saying, come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. When the church age is over, I want you, John, to understand what's going to take place down on the earth while the church is present in my throne room. Verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, now, don't, don't overlook that word immediately. Immediately. When the rapture takes place, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I was caught up into his presence and changed. And this mortal took on the immortality. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, immediately, John says, I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven. So where is the throne of God? It's in heaven. Where is it geographically located? You want me to tell you where it is? It's in the northern hemisphere. Because if you go to Ezekiel, or uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, it says that when Satan rebelled against God, he said, I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to overthrow your throne. There's going to be a coup, and I'm going to sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. He gave us a clue. Satan said, when I overthrow the throne of God, I'm going to take the position on the throne, and the throne is in the furthest sides of the north. Look at verse 13 when you get a chance in Isaiah 14. It gives us the geographical location of where God's throne is. There's a whole invisible realm out there, and somewhere in that realm, in the furthest sides of the north, is where the throne of God is. That is the place where Satan walked. His name was Lucifer, by the way. He walked in the midst of the fiery stones. He was a created being. He was anointed cherub who covered. He had access to the very presence of God as he dwelt in heaven and he was made perfect. He was the seal of perfection. 
And because of his beauty and because of his gifts and his talents, because the pipes and the timbrels and the instruments, the musical instruments, they were prepared for him on the day he was created. But because of his beauty, because of his pride, he thought that somehow he could overthrow the throne of God and he could take over and be God. I will be like the Most High. It was an attempted coup in heaven. He wanted to sit on the throne of God. But the throne of God is set. There's no variation when it comes to the throne of God. We know Satan has his throne in several cities. We already saw that in the letters to the church. We know that he has thrones and dominions and principalities and powers and spiritual wicked beings in high places. He occupies thrones in certain cities, but his thrones are not set. They can be moved, they can be relocated because his dominion is not an everlasting dominion. His dominion is coming to an end. His power, his reign, his coup that he attempted was cast down and it's going to be destroyed when all this is over. God's just allowing him to remain to accomplish his purpose in the earth to redeem a people that reject him and love God. And when that day comes, Satan will be destroyed and finally in Revelation 20, gathered up by the Lord and thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet will already be. He will come to his end. The prophet said, you will be cast down to the ground. You will be utterly destroyed by God. Don't you love that? The enemy that we face is already a defeated enemy. It's already predetermined by God that they will be destroyed. Not only him, but all his principalities and powers and spiritual wicked forces, they're all going to be destroyed by Almighty God, the one who's on the throne in the war room. His throne is set. It's unbelievable. Are you guys liking what's here? I mean, it's amazing, man. So the throne was set in heaven. There is a heaven. And one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. He's not a jasper stone. He's not a sardis stone. He's like a jasper stone, sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So a jasper stone is clear, transparent, probably a reference to diamonds. The Sardis stone is like ruby red in appearance. This rainbow that's over the throne and around the throne, like a halo around the throne, that's kind of the picture that's being painted as God sits on the throne. You have all these gems and all these jewels, and there's all kind of views on this, and people want to make it the breastplates on the priests in the Old Testament. Maybe it has some reference to that. But I don't think it has to be that. I think it's just simple that the riches and the treasures of heaven are like construction material. And you have all these beautiful gems and stones and golden streets and everything, and the Shekinah glory of God is illuminating the throne and the city that's going to come down from God, and you got all this fractional light reflecting off of these gems, and, and, and you can't really look, you know, you ever try to look at the sun and you just see a big blotch, Right? So when you look at the person sitting on the throne, the person of God, you're not going to see the image of a man. You're going to see all this beautiful light just illuminating from the throne because God is present on the throne. God dwells in unapproachable light, the Bible says. And in 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says God is light. Now turn with me real quick to Revelation 21 because I think this might make more sense if we read it. Revelation 21, look at verse 10.
one of the angels comes to John. This is a different vision. Carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now jump over to verse 18. The construction of its walls was of jasper. And the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city, that's the holy city, the new Jerusalem. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. All kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second was sapphire. The third was chalcedony. And the fourth, emerald, and the fifth, sardoni, sardonyx, and the sixth, sardis, and the seventh, chrysolite, and the eighth, bureau, and the ninth, topaz, and the tenth, uh, chrysophras, and, and the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amaranth. So there you have all these beautiful gems, and I've probably butchered the pronunciation of some of them, but you get the idea, right? The construction of the city, the construction of the city is made with all these beautiful gems and diamonds and gold and golden streets. And then it goes on to say, and the light of the city is the Lord God and the Lamb, because inside the city there's no temple, and there's no need for the sun, and there's no need for the moon, because the Shekinah glory, the light and the brilliancy of God Almighty illuminates the city. So imagine what that's going to be like for us when we suddenly leave here in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, and we're standing before him, and we're looking at this beautiful appearance of these gems and this light and this refracting, refracting light coming from the throne. Imagine what that's going to be like for us to behold. John's there, and he's looking at it. He sees it. Now, obviously, God had to fix his eyes. Otherwise, he would never be able to stand in the presence of God. But this is being allowed so that he can bring this word back to the church. So I don't make a big deal about the jasper and the sardis stone. It's just construction material. It's construction material for the eternal kingdom. And obviously, the same construction material is present in the throne room of God, and because it's there, there's all this light and all this brilliance coming from the throne. I can't wait to see this. There was a rainbow around the throne, an appearance like an emerald. Some say it's possible that the rainbow is a reminder of God's covenant and God's promise to never destroy the earth again. And that's a possibility, but this isn't an ordinary seven-colored rainbow. This is like a greenish-type rainbow over the throne. Could symbolize the promise that God's not going to destroy the earth again with a flood, but now he's going to do it with fire, according to 2 Peter chapter 3. God is going to use fire to destroy the earth and burn it up, and eventually the whole earth and the whole universe will be destroyed according to Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. Everything in the world, in the universe, is going to be dissolved and there's going to be a new universe and a new heaven and a new earth and a new city coming down out of heaven from God. And the material used in this city is all these beautiful gems, gold, precious Rubies and rainbows. and Hard to wrap your mind around that, isn't it? But it is what the Bible says. In verse 4, we see around the throne, there were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So there before the throne, God is on the throne, and now we're looking at something before the throne. 
over the throne and around the throne. It's the rainbow. There's the emeralds. There's the jewels. There's the beautiful gemstones. And now before the throne, there's 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white rooms with crowns of gold on their head. Now we have to like look at this because there are people that say that this is not the church. Obviously this can't be the church because the church isn't just 24 people. But what do elders represent? Elders represent the church, right? And so we have 24 elders sitting on these thrones and we believe, I believe, that these 24 elders represent the church before the throne. Now, here's why these elders can't be angels, because some people want to make these elders angels because you have the four living creatures that are seraphim, cherubim, and they're around the throne, and you know all the angels are there, ten thousands and thousands of angels are, are there before the throne, and some people want to make these elders angels also. But look over at chapter 7 of Revelation. Turn over a few pages there. Look at what it says in verse 11. And all the angels stood around, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. So hopefully you can see that there, that the elders are separate from the four living creatures and they're separate from all the angels. So you have these three groups there in heaven. You have all the angels. You have the four living creatures, the, the worship leaders of heaven. They're the ones that lead worship in heaven. And then you have the elders. Now, over in 1 Chronicles chapter 24 and 25, you have 24, the number 24, used in a way of representation. And that's important. Because you got to ask yourself, if we're trying to make these 24 elders, those who represent the church, is that used anywhere else in Scripture? Can we find a place in Scripture to support the idea of 24 elders representing a group or a congregation. And if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 24 and 25, you will see how the priestly tribes were divided up into 24 groups. And then the singers and the worshipers were also divided up into 24 groups. And those two 24 groups actually represented the entire nation of Israel. So it's not unbiblical for us to say that 24 elders or the number 24 represents a larger body. So the 24 elders here are representing the church. And you might say, well, how do we know they're not representing Israel again? Well, because Israel hasn't been redeemed yet. Look at chapter 7 again. Look at verse 13 of chapter 7 in Revelation. Then one of the elders, one of the elders answered, saying to me, talking to John. So John can't be one of the elders. One of the elders is talking to John. It can't be the 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs because these elders are actually communicating with John. I think if John was one of the elders, he would say, oh, look, there's me on one of those thrones, right? So it can't be John, can't be the apostles. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? This is a multitude out of the tribulation that gets saved. And I said to him, sir, you, you know, I'm not even going to try to answer that question. John was pretty wise. So he said to me, these are the ones that come out of the great tribulation. They went through the whole thing and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them, and they'll never hunger again, they'll never thirst again. The reason they're not going to hunger again is because they went through the wars and the famines and the pestilence and through the great tribulation, and at the end of the tribulation, 
they get redeemed and they get their new bodies. And at that point, they're before the throne. But we're not to that point. You guys following? We're not to that point. So this can't be the representation of a great multitude that comes out of the tribulation. And it can't be a, refer a, a reference to Israel because Israel's in the same boat. They haven't been fully redeemed yet because they're going to be saved, like we already read, during the tribulation. They're going to come through it. And at the end of it, one third of Israel will be saved. You might say, well, Ken, I thought you said all Israel will be saved. We read that back there in Romans 11. All Israel will be saved, but you have to ask yourself, who is all Israel? Paul said, not all Israel is Israel. Not all Jews are Jews. So all Israel are those who truly come to saving faith in their Messiah during the tribulation. All of them who put their faith in their Messiah, all of them will be saved. Every single one of them. In fact, it'll be one-third one-third of them will come through the fire of the tribulation and they will be saved. According to Zechariah 13.9. Two-thirds will be lost in the tribulation because they're not real Israel and they're not real Jews and they never came to saving faith in their Messiah and they will be left to die during the tribulation. But one-third will come through the fire. So the point here is the 24 elders in verse 4 of chapter 4, can't be Israel, can't be the multitude that came out of the tribulation, and they can't be angels. That only leaves one other group. The church. The church is now in the presence of God because the church age has come to a close. Now here's where it gets even more interesting. Because if you look at these elders, you can clearly see that they're seated on thrones, they have crowns of gold, they have white robes. And you can clearly go back to the letters and read what Jesus promised to the overcomers. And you will see in the church of Smyrna, he promised that he would give them a crown of life. To the church of Laodicea, he promised the overcomers in that church that they would sit on thrones with him. And then we see in the letter to Sardis, because there will be overcomers that come out of the church of Sardis, the dead church, and they will be given white robes. So the Holy Spirit's assuming that you are a, a Bible student and you've actually remembered what you read about those who overcome. And if you do remember what Jesus said to the overcomers in the church, then you can look at this group and say it fits perfectly with what Jesus said to the church. It's amazing. It's amazing. The word of God is amazing. All we have to do is dig in and study it. Now, there are some things coming from the throne. The 24 elders are around the throne. And now there are things proceeding from the throne. Lightnings, thunders, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. So the lamps of fire are before the throne but the lightning, the thundering, and the voices are coming from the throne. So we have the one who's on the throne. We see what's around the throne. We see stuff coming from the throne because this is the war room of heaven. Now, turn with me real quick to Revelation 13, 3, or I'm sorry, 8, 3. Revelation 8, 3. Get a better idea of the lightning, the thunderings. What's that mean? We're all in heaven and we're witnessing lightning and thundering and all this stuff coming from the throne. It's coming out from the throne. Remember, this is the war room. This is the heavenly pentagon. This is where the commander and the chief is seated on his throne and he's about to call the shots of judgment that's going to be directed down to the earth. This is, this is no game. Notice what it says there in chapter 8. Pick it up there in verse 3. 
Then another angel having the golden censer, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar that's also before the throne, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thundering, lightning, and an earthquake. So the heavenly presence of God in his throne room is gearing up for what's about to take place on the earth. And John sees lightning, fire, and we know there's going to be an earthquake in the middle of the tribulation. There's going to be several earthquakes. So the judgment of God is now stirring up It's being stirred in the throne room. And when those prayers are offered up to God for the saints, from the saints, from the golden altar, God's going to release a judgment from one of these angels. And they're going to be poured out and lightning and thundering and fire and hail is going to come down upon the earth somewhere around the middle of the tribulation period. And so we kind of see the beginning of that here. And I don't know that we can really make any more you know, of this than what the book of Revelation tells us. It's just pretty simple. And so again, we see the seven lamps of fire that were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We've already talked about the seven spirits of God. Isaiah 11 verse 2 talks about the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Some people think this is a reference to the seven angels. I don't think so because when Jesus addressed himself to the church in Sardis, he said, I am the one who has the seven stars, which are the seven angels and the seven spirits of God. So the two are not the same even though it's possible that the Holy Spirit is moving upon these angels to activate them to accomplish God's purpose and God's will on the earth. Is that making sense? So these seven lamps of fire represent the Holy Spirit in his full power, in his full ability to bring the judgments that are coming upon the earth, and the Holy Spirit is before the throne of God. The seven lamps of fire are burning. And we know that could also possibly be a reference to the church since the church is spoken of in Revelation chapter one as the one that has the seven, the church is the seven golden lampstands. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know. There are some things here we can't be dogmatic about. We're not 100% sure. But one thing for sure is God's there. The Holy Spirit's there. And in chapter 5, guess who arrives? Jesus walks in. So you have the Godhead working together to bring about wrath and judgment on a world that has been in rebellion to him. Then we see here in verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were the four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion and the second living creature like a calf. And the third living creature had the face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now there's all kind of views on the living creatures. Right? You go to Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, and you read about these same angels. We know they're angels. They're some higher order of angels, and their position is to never take their eyes off of God. They have eyes within, eyes all around. They have wheels. They have like this chariot. They all move in unison together. They're all united in this oneness. Whenever God moves, they move. They constantly watch God. They see everything God's doing and they lead the worship of God in heaven. I encourage you guys to go back and read Ezekiel 1 and and chapter 10 if you don't come on Saturday mornings. We've been looking at all that. So here we see there's this sea of glass and 
on the sea of glass, there seems to be like these cherubim that are present either on the sea of glass, the sea of glass is before the throne, there's a whole bunch of ideas about the sea of glass. We don't really know what it is. For me, it kind of speaks to me about the calm before the storm. The sea in Revelation 13 speaks of the multitudes, the nations, the peoples. And in Revelation 17, 15, it tells us about the sea being peoples, multitudes, and nations. So I don't know if this is the nations of all the redeemed in the church that are standing before the throne with all this activity and they're being calm like a sea of glass. Maybe. Or is it some floor that's before the throne that's transparent where God can look down through the floor and see everything going on on the earth. Maybe. We can't be, we don't know. But in Revelation 15, the sea of glass shows up again and the sea of glass in Revelation 15 is mingled with fire. And so it's very possible that the sea of glass here is calm because the judgment hasn't been rolled out yet. But when the judgment is rolled out, it's now mixed with fire because the fire is coming down through the sea of glass because God sees everything, he knows everything, and now it's time to judge the earth. That's a possibility. Now, we can sit here and we can speculate about these four living creatures, their faces, and there's all kinds of thoughts on it. You know, the bottom line for me is what I see for sure. There's one thing for sure about these four living creatures. They are angels. They are a high order of angels. Lucifer was probably one of these higher order of angels because Lucifer was a worship leader in heaven. The pipes, the timbrels, all that was prepared for him on the day he was created. And so it's possible that there were five of them, but Satan, Lucifer rebelled, and now there's four of them. One thing we can see for sure, that they are the worship leaders in heaven. They lead worship. And they watch God. And they always exalt God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So when it comes to these four living creatures, instead of getting off on a whole lot of wild tangents and conversations about it, it's just simple. They're higher ranking angels that lead and worship before the throne. That's what they are. They have wings. With two, they cover their face. With two, they fly. With two, they cover their feet. We know that from Isaiah chapter 6. So there are some things we do know about them. And they are involved with the judgment and the worship of God before the throne of God. Verse 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings, which are full of eyes around and within, they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And I don't really have to expound on that because we've been over that. This speaks of the eternal nature of God, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. He is the almighty God who is the everlasting God. His throne is set. He's always on the throne. He'll never be off the throne. He's in total control of the entire universe. The Bible says he sits in the heavens in Psalm 115 and does whatever he pleases. No one can restrain his hand. No one in heaven, no one in earth, no one can restrain his hand. He is the almighty, the all-powerful God. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, the church falls right in sync with these worship leaders of heaven and we all fall down before him who sits on the throne and we worship him who lives forever and ever. And while we're down there prostrate before him, we take off our crowns and we cast them at his feet because he is the only one worthy to be worshipped. What a day this is going to be for us. 
when we're there and the elders start singing with the angels, holy, 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 and we all hit the ground and we bow down before the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come and we take our crowns and we throw them at his feet saying, you are worthy, O Lord. Wow, what a time that's going to be. Verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all all things, and by your will, they exist and were created. What a chapter. Can't wait for that day. If you're here tonight and you've been struggling, you've had a rough year, you have physical problems, health problems, marriage problems, whatever it is, you need to understand that God is on the throne. God is on the throne. And in one day, because we're in the last days, in one moment, all your problems, all your struggles could be instantly gone. And you can be in the presence of the only one who's worthy to receive worship. Can't wait for that day. Let's pray.